right, well, welcome to the Dixon's Virtual Merch and Learn. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I'm told to tell you to take time to mute yourself if you're not already muted. And Lindley is recording this and it will be added to the Dixon's YouTube channel. So you can find these videos and other videos about art and horticulture at dixon.org at the Dixon homepage. So Lindley also will be uh, taking questions uh, during the talk, if a question pops into your head, uh, just go ahead and click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen and type in the question. And uh, there'll be time for questions at the end of the talk. Okay, so today we are happy to have uh, Mike Larity here. He's a, he's a licensed professional geologist and he's worked for nearly a decade as an environmental, uh, an environmental consultant. He has a master's degree of science from Earth Sciences Department at the University of Memphis and continued his training at, as a William J. Fulbright Scholarship winner in Latvia. Love to hear about that sometime. In 2019, Mike became the vice president of the Tennessee chapter of the Composting Council. He is the founder and executive director of Compost Ferry, a nonprofit waste division and soil rehabilitation effort founded in Memphis in 2017. Compost Ferry won the Excellence in Green Business Award from the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council in 2018 and the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award in 2019. But, uh, I hope you'll talk a little bit about the Compost Ferry. It's kind of a really, really neat concept uh, uh, that, uh, that he has. So anyway, with, without any further to do, I will turn this over to Mike Clarity. Thanks, Dale. I appreciate that. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Yes, we okay. Do. Good deal. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. So, uh, yes, I am Mike and I am the director of the compost ferry. Uh, and I can answer questions about that later if you like, but right now we're here to talk about native plants and not only how wonderful and easy to take care of they are, but how, you know, they are a matter of uh, civic responsibility, even, and uh, being a good steward uh, and making responsible choices. Uh, and uh, I am a shameless acolyte of Doug Tallamy, uh, among other folks. Uh, if you haven't read uh, Bringing Nature Home uh, or Nature's Best Hope, I would highly recommend those if you're interested uh, in native plants at all. Uh, all right, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I just wrote a, a, a letter for uh, basically an update in Edible Memphis Magazine. Uh, folks often talk to me about the feeling of, you know, hopelessness that they're experiencing in a, a world with so many problems and things seem just so out of control and that helplessness uh, comes along with a feeling of uh, nothing I do is going to matter. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've kind of thrown up your hands and given up. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that everything we do matters. Uh, and that's, that fundamental difference in philosophy has gotten us somewhat into the mess that we're in right now. Um, so, it's important to remember that when the left side of the country is on fire and you see videos of polar bears swimming across open ocean, uh, where there used to be ice pack, sea pack, um, everything you do makes a difference. And that difference is cumulative. Um, so planting native plants in your backyard may seem like a silly little difference and a small change, but it can have a huge impact. Uh, and as my friend, Diane says, everything you do multiply by 7 billion. Um, actually, more like making up on 8 billion now, I guess. So uh, it's, a, it's a, an interesting way to look at things for sure. Um, so shameless plug. Uh, I know we're all gardeners here, of course. Uh, if, it's kind of like cooking. If you wanna pretend that you're good at cooking, just learn how to use stock because it all starts with the foundation. If you want to pretend to be a good gardener like I do, um, add some organic to your soil. Uh, compost is pretty much 
the easiest lifestyle change uh, you can make to reduce negative impacts on your environment on top of everything else. Uh, we are a culture of instant gratification uh, and skipping the trash can and not sending that stuff to the landfill and putting it into an industrial compost operation like I run is uh, immediate impact and satisfies that instant gratification that's in our consumer culture. Um, so if you're looking for a way to live your green values, uh, there are very few uh, ways to do that uh, that are more accessible or easier to change. Uh, and as I said, I mean, that's about the easiest tool you can add to your toolbox for success in the garden. Um, adding compost or organic material to your soil uh, increases the immune response of your plant, so they're more resistant to pathogens and pests. Uh, it uh, re reduces drought and heat stress um, and makes the soil biologically active and creates the relationship below ground. Uh, that is necessary for plants to thrive and be successful. Uh, soil is the foundation of the terrestrial ecosystem uh, and it's biology, not, uh, not chemistry and geology. Uh, and I have both perspectives, so you can listen to me on that. Um, yeah, and we already sort of went through that. So here's a picture of Overton Park. Right, it's very nice over there. I'm kidding. Uh, that's Mount Rainier in the background, uh, and that's a, a lovely alpine ecosystem right there. That is definitely not Memphis, but everybody loves uh, nature. That I think we can agree on. Um, but what about this guy right there, or that, or that? It's still nature. Uh, putting a, a gate around it, or, uh, or a fence up. It doesn't mean it's not part of planet Earth anymore, uh, also known as nature. The rules still apply. Uh, so what's, what's happening here at home in the United States? Uh, I did a lot of my research in Europe, but it's, uh, my training as an ecologist uh, applies here uh, as well. Um, we have great big cities that like to sprawl, and I'm excited to see a lot of the infill development that's happening in Memphis. Uh, but it's going in both directions. I've been to Rossville lately or Tipton County. I think uh, you can see lots of evidence of that. Uh, our urban centers are definitely growing. And in the last 50 years, uh, a lot of that uh, exurban area has been converted uh, to suburbs and lots of asphalt and Bradford pears and grape myrtles and stuff that don't do uh, a whole lot for the native environment. Small farms have been replaced by big giant uh, commodity row crop agriculture, uh, basically ecological deserts that use lots and lots of synthetic chemicals and uh, or operate in monocultures. Monocultures don't happen very often in nature uh, and don't pro provide much in the way of ecological services. Uh, and all of those chemicals going on in our food uh, is really pretty gross. I think if we live long enough as a species to look back on this era in history, they'll think we're a bunch of madmen uh, for intentionally growing our food in toxic chemicals and known carcinogens, which I think every day is pretty amazing. Get to know your farmer, I guess, is uh, the shorthand message there. There are lots of good folks uh, growing healthy, responsible, regenerative uh, uh, food production systems here in town. Uh, and I'm happy to point you in those directions. So as far as the wildlands are concerned, what's left? Uh, about 12% of the lower 48 uh, is considered a, a natural area. Uh, and that includes national forests, in the state natural areas and scenic waterways, uh, like the White Mountain National Forest, where I grew up, um, not a whole lot. And sadly, half of that is open now to mining and other uh, extractive activities like logging. Uh, and that amount is growing, sadly, instead of uh, shrinking. Uh, only about 5% of our fractured and divided wildlands remain intact. And that puts more 
uh, responsibility as us, as landowners, uh, than ever before, really. Um, we have the capacity to undo some of those terrible large scale changes. Uh, and there's my guy again, Dr. Tallamy, uh, out of the University of Delaware. And as I said, if you're looking uh, for a, uh, a comprehensive why of, of the impact of using natives in the landscape, I think there would be, you'd have a hard time finding anything that's more, uh, more impactful than this book right here. My dogs are going crazy now. That's funny. Um, yeah, big fan. I've got a little bit of a man crush on Dr. Tallamy. I'm not afraid to admit it. It's a little bit of Captain Planet, a little bit of Superman all wrapped up into one. Here's my friend right there. Um, and Caroline, my girlfriend, uh, created this Bitmoji for me. And that's, that's the mic sign of approval for plant material, wherever you see that in the rest of this presentation. Uh, that's a native that is approved for use in the West Tennessee landscape by me and also Caroline. Um, so big, big change it seems like. Where can we start? Uh, Doug called in uh, exotics and invasive green statues because they don't really engage uh, with the the native ecosystem and uh, do a very poor job of cycling nutrients up through the food web. Uh, that's a Chinese privet and see. These two-dimensional uh, conversations are wonderful, but I love a live audience because then we get to get engaged and boo and hiss when we see the horrible Chinese privet, right? For sure. I did a, a land cover survey when I was in graduate school at the University of Memphis of uh, Shelby Farms Park, which is a wonderful place, uh, uh, and sadly, the sub canopy of over of, of Shelby Farms is 80% Chinese privet. Uh, uh, most of the sub canopy species have been replaced by that junk, sadly, uh, and it's really hard to get rid of once it has established itself. Uh, here's some. Lovely alternatives. I know lots of folks are always asking me uh, for native uh, evergreens because we love that that uh, that foundation planting little meatball that, that that sits on either side of our front door. And there are a few here. The the Carolina cherry laurel is definitely an evergreen uh, and provides a nice screen. It doesn't like to stay a little itty bitty uh, like a boxwood, but it's very nice. Um, Possum haw and uh, American holly are both in the ilex family and provide winter interest. It's not necessarily a little green ball, uh, but they have pretty uh, pretty uh, red fruit in the wintertime. And the winter birds, uh, especially your little cedar waxwings that come through here in the summertime, will love you for planting those guys. And also, uh, my buddy Chris that runs Alpha Omega Veterans Urban Farm calls me Mikey Buttonbush because I sing the praises of the Cephalanthus occidentalis uh, all over town. And I'm very happy to see so many of these little guys uh, uh, all in, in places where I've been able to talk folks into it. And uh, without fail, once it's in the ground and starts to bloom in uh, late May, early June, all the way through October, they're still blooming right now. Uh, people uh, fall in love with them as much as I do. They're a great replacement uh, for the butterfly bush, the bidea, which uh, is not native here, uh, provides very little in the way of ecological services um, and causes some other problems that we'll talk about here in a little bit. But if you're looking for a pollinator magnet, uh, dozens of species of Hymenoptera, the bees and hornets and all those fellas use it. Lepidopterans love it. Little skippers all the way up to the great big swallowtails and uh, monarchs are all over it. It provides a lot of nectar uh, for a long, long bloom period. Um, so button bush. Uh, they're very easy to come by these days. There are, there are 
have friends in the nursery business that are stocking them uh, as there has uh, as interest has grown. At any rate, there's me giving the thumbs up to all those pretty North American uh, Eastern biome species. Good replacements for privet. What about this guy? The English ivy. Ooh, right? Yeah, I like to call that the oak killer. It's uh, it's the only thing I know of that can take an oak down uh, other than a, a May windstorm uh, <laughs> in Memphis, sadly. Uh, some great replacements for that. This guy down here uh, in the lower right is green and gold. Uh, and that is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm from New England, as I said, that doesn't grow super well in my heat zone, but it, it does great here. And point of fact, the more you ignore it, uh, the better it does. And it's very versatile. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't super love blasting, blazing hot sun, uh, but it grows in pretty heavy shade. Uh, if you're looking for a replacement for English ivy, uh, I would thoroughly recommend it. And there's my my buddy, the not poison ivy up there in the uh, upper right. Um, that's the Virginia creeper. Uh, and he can be a little bit of a thug in the garden. Uh, so you have to be careful. They tend to be pretty aggressive and take over, but they are uh, a wonderful food source. Lots of, lots of Lepidoptera uh, host on that and the the berries that they leave in the fall and early winter are super valuable to the little birds that tend to stick around in Tennessee uh, in the cold months. There's the Bradford pear, everybody's favorite tree, right? I heard that referred to once as the cockroach of the tree kingdom, which I find quite accurate. It's just an awful tree. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what happens to that guy when he escapes captivity. Uh, but it was voted the worst tree out there by Southern Living Magazine. And you know, the, the fine ladies at Southern Living are, are casting dispersions on the Brad Prepare that it has earned them. Uh, who knows about service berries? Weren't they just beautiful? There's a, there's a whole bunch that we planted uh, in the Spanish American War Park uh, on the corner of East Parkway and Central, if you're ever driving by there. Um, and they're all dedicated to, to different horticulturalists in the neighborhood. Uh, but that's a great uh, food source for the birds and also edible to humans. And it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful in the springtime. Uh, there are several species of Amelachia that, that grow quite well in Memphis. Uh, and they're getting easier to find as well. Uh, so thumbs up and sweet bay magnolia, which is a sometimes an evergreen here, uh, and definitely not basic as the Bradford pear, um, but also super pretty in the springtime. Uh, so I guess you know other than you know the aesthetic qualities, why why is it important for us to be looking at? Uh, replacing some of the exotic plants in our landscape. As we said, exotic plants are green statues and don't really engage the lower trophic layers in our native community, the bugs and stuff that cycle those leaves up into uh, the food web. Uh, they evolved elsewhere uh, without the benefit of relationships to the, to the little bugs and creatures that are from our part of the world. Uh, and as I said, they do not cycle nutrients very well. Uh, who knows what that guy is right there? Have you seen him before? It's a monarch, right? What does a monarch grow on? What about that guy? That's a spice bush swallowtail. Uh, and guess what it grows on, right? Uh, no spice bush, no spice bush swallowtails. And they're awful pretty when they grow up, too. I can tell you that. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing in like the commercial plant material market, you'll see things marketed as pest free. And basically that means provides no ecological services. Uh, they are uh, sterile in the environment, uh, more or less. Most insects like the ones that you see over there on the right hand side are specialists, not generalists, right? So monarchs uh, evolved with milkweeds, right? So Asclepius 
is one of the very, very few genus of you know, genera plant that, uh, that monarchs can use. No milkweeds, no monarchs. Direct correlation there. Uh, zebra swallowtail, who knows about pawpaws? I heard somebody call those <laughs> the redneck mango the other day. It's pretty funny. It's the largest fruit native to North, uh, North America. And if uh, there are no uh, Amazonia trilobias, there are no beautiful zebra swallowtails like that guy right there. Um, they are not generalists like these guys. Who knows what those are? Anybody has a rose bush? Uh, is probably familiar with the Japanese beetle. They come and skeletonize stuff in the summertime. Um, so, uh, if that hasn't convinced you that using native plant material is important and, uh, and you don't like butterflies, uh, first off, I'm not sure what's wrong with you. Uh, everybody loves butterflies. Um, but if you're more of a bird person, uh, you got your little brown thrasher here and the bluebird and cedar waxwing. Um, 90, 95% of the babies that these little guys make, uh, their diet comes from mostly caterpillars, right? Caterpillars are super, super calorie dense, uh, for their fast growing babies. Uh, they don't eat seeds. And sadly, uh, Dr. Talamy was part of a study in the mid Atlantic and they, they went into the suburban neighborhood and started looking at nests and found tons and tons of starved little baby birds with their stomachs crammed full of seeds from bird feeders from well-intentioned folks that were trying to take care of the birds and didn't realize that that seeds are pr primarily for adult birds uh and uh that was that was a sort of a revelatory uh moment for me reading that study uh, we need to provide for all of the stages uh life cycle uh of you know animals otherwise we're interrupting that that uh that cycle and we won't have uh the next generation sadly what about everything else so most of the energy on planet earth uh in the biosphere comes from the sun uh and plants a long time ago learned this magic trick called photosynthesis where they take sunlight right out of the thin air uh, and CO2 and some water and turn it into sugar. It's pretty magical. Um, and it kind of works like this. So you get your primary producers down there on the bottom, all your chlorophytic plants that are, that are photosynthesizing and turning solar energy uh, into sugar. And then you have your primary consumers, the little mice and bugs and caterpillars and ants and everything else that are, that are eating those leaves and then in turn being eaten by birds uh, and larger mammals and uh, amphibians and all sorts of other stuff and up and up and up through the trophic layers to the, to the predators, the great big bad guys up here at the top. Um, but all these little babies are dependent on that first layer of production being cycled up into the uh, food web. Uh, including these ones. Uh, and that is an awfully cute baby. I picked, I picked that one on purpose. I'm, I'm definitely manipulating you right now. I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning. Um, but it, all of this to say that this entire system has direct impact on our ability to survive as well. These babies as well as the little squirrel babies and possum babies over there on the left. Uh, yeah, ecological services. If it's pest-free, it is definitely not part of the food web uh, because they're not pests. They're from here for the most part, unless they came in with exotic plants, which is also a thing that happens quite frequently, sadly. Um, but these guys here uh, have a tendency to take advantage of the landscape disturbance that we create uh, in, pers in any persistent disturbance is going to invite uh, invasive plants to take advantage of that opportunity. You have to think about bare soil, right? We're excited for some reason about tilling and digging and, and just disturbing the mess out of the soil. Uh, bare soil in nature happens in the desert, which often is created by us, uh, and the beach, right? You leave a spot of bare soil 
in West Tennessee, it's not staying bare for very long. So keep that guy occupied, occupied with something that is useful to you instead of going to cause you problems and cost you money, right? There's those stupid Bradford pairs again. Uh, this is an exciting thing. I don't know how much y'all know about the calorie pair, uh, but when it escapes cultivation and gets back out into nature and starts to do its own thing, uh, especially when it uh, starts to commingle with the food production pairs, uh, it tends to revert to its native form. Uh, the native form is a thorn thicket, essentially. And you ask any row crop agriculturalist these days, uh, uh, and those folks are spending billions of dollars a year trying to get rid of these things in the hedgerows, uh, what those thorns will do to the tires on their super expensive equipment. Uh, they don't have much, farmers don't have much good to say about the Bradford pair these days either. Naughty, naughty. There's that thorn right there. Um, biodiversity. So that's, oops, that's a, that's a big, that's a big buzzword uh, these days, and it's starting to gain some resonance in the community. Um, and as you can see, you know, plants photosynthesize. Plants uh, have a basic suite of services that they provide, whether they're from here or not. Um, they filter water and air. Uh, they they are effective at sequestering carbon um, and help to reduce urban heat island effect. Um, a, uh, a tree of heaven, for example, uh, makes shade in the same way that an oak tree does. Uh, that's about the end of uh, the comparison as far as I'm concerned. Um, but they do not promote or maintain biodiversity. Uh, they they tend to outcompete some of our native folks that take longer to establish um, and reduce the resiliency in the system. And uh, redundancy is the word that gets used a lot. I'm going to say resilience. Uh, you have a big V8. Let's, let's, let's take a nice one, like a Mercedes uh, V8 or something like that, big purring well-tuned machine and you start pulling little bits and pieces and parts out of that uh, out of that engine uh, and you lose uh, one or two the engine will probably still run you lose three or four and it may start to run a little rough uh, eventually you pull enough pieces out of that machine and the engine's going to stop running and that's kind of why biodiversity is important because if we start running out of pieces which we are we're in the middle of an extinction again uh right now uh that redundancy and resiliency is going to deteriorate uh and if things stop to function that's bad for animals uh including us uh the probability of survival in a system that is severely compromised gets lower and lower uh Here's the here's the fun comparison game. So the next time it's coming up on planting season right now. Everybody, you're all smart gardeners. You know that that woodies and perennials should be going in the ground in the fall and early winter in Memphis. Um, so when the next time you plant a tree, maybe consider one of these guys. Anybody know who that is? Circus canadensis, the little red bud, it grows in a crack in the sidewalk pretty much here. I don't know why this city isn't covered with those pretty things. That's a uh, they give me hope every spring. I love them. Um, 135 species of Lepidoptera uh, are able to host on that plant. Um, Lepidoptera, for all the folks in the back, uh, is uh, moths and butterflies. Uh, there are 17 species of moth for every one species of butterfly, by the way. Moths are very important as well. Uh, what's this guy? I mean, that's a pretty cultivar of Cornus, Florida, right? Little dogwood. 117 species of butterflies can and moths can use that as a host plant. Oh, there's the crepe myrtle. They're so pretty, and I would love to go and visit them in India, where they're from. I'm so tired of seeing them here in Memphis. Uh, and 
this guy is excited to see them again. That's Crepe Myrtle Bark Scale. Anybody that's got Crepe Myrtles right now is probably familiar with that little guy. These little white dots right there are actually scale bugs. There's a little pink nasty underneath that hard shell, and they suck the sap of your Crepe Myrtle uh, to death eventually. Uh, not very nice. Uh, but they were imported uh, with crepe myrtles as well. They're not from here either. Uh, twice stabbed lady beetle is a native ladybug uh, that eats those. So encourage habitat for twice stabbed lady beetles if you want to help your crepe myrtle to survive without lots of poisons. Um, yeah, there they are. What's this guy? That's a mighty Quercus, a little oak tree, right? Oak trees are wonderful and they are. Um, in Dr. Tallamy's words, the grand kuba of, uh, of uh, host plants in the eastern deciduous biome that we live in. Uh, Quercus, the last time they counted, hosts 557 species of Lepidoptera, and that's just the butterflies. That doesn't count beetles and shield bugs and, and hornets and, and all sorts of other important species in our ecosystem, uh, and that definitely gets the mic thumbs up. Uh, not this tree of heaven. Tree of heaven, if you notice where she tends to grow, it's along areas of persistent disturbance in the urban environment, right? Very poor soil, so along railroad lines and in vacant lots uh, and all sorts of neglected and abused properties. Uh, they love it when we make a mess out of things. They're happy to take advantage of it. And they provide no hosting abilities for native insects at all. Uh, this is an interesting thing. We, I, I used to, I added this slide because I used to get questions about specifics. So like dogwoods, right? So you know, the American dogwood here on the left and then the Kusa Asian dogwood on the right. Uh, that's where things get interesting. And then you, same thing over here, you got a, a Acer rubra, the no oh, common names, uh, red maple on the left and Japanese Asian maple on the right. Here come some fancy numbers, zeros, because they're, they, uh, they were pre-pangeal genus, uh, uh, genera. That means that they were here. Uh, they were present on planet Earth when there was still a supercontinent, uh, and they divided millions and millions and millions of years ago. So the dogwoods that uh, moved with Asia um, evolved separately from the dogwoods that 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 uh, that grew here in the Americas, uh, and evolved in a different community of insects and animals. So the animals here don't know what to do with a kusa dogwood. They're not close enough in relation genetically to be useful to those animals. Same thing with Japanese maples. So there's uh, our budea again the butterfly bush. And it is a great source of, ne of nectar. They make lots of sugar and they bloom for a very long time. Uh, here's a thing that I learned that sort of blew my mind it, and uh, I had no idea. And uh, it was one of those, oh my gosh, moments uh, that sort of push you forward in your knowledge, I think. Uh, migrating pollinators need fat, not sugar for their long trip south. Um, and these Bidea are making sugar. And what happens is our poor little migrating pollinators like the monarch uh, fly around and eat and eat and eat on this plant and stay too long and wind up uh, freezing out instead of traveling south because they're looking for fat reserves that they can't get from this plant. Uh, so our well intentions of planting pollinator friendly invasive or exotic plants uh, are actually, actually uh, inadvertently starving our little butterfly friends. So if you're looking to support the butterflies that are headed south this time of year, uh, here's a couple of great alternatives. This is Joe Pieweed uh, and showy goldenrod and button bush and oh, thoroughwort. I went I think I skipped it. Dang it, it's not in there. Uh, at any rate, all of those are, are prairie plants that, that love to grow here in Memphis. Uh, 
and provide lots and lots of fat uh, or, or transferable fat, sugars to fat for those, for those late uh, traveling pollinators like that handsome little fellow there on the bottom. Uh, there's, the, there's the Nandina. We see the Nandina in office parks throughout the, the Mid-South. Uh, and they provide that pretty red berry for winter interest uh, in the cold months here. It's, uh, <laughs> we call it the invasive exotic murderer of the cedar waxwing because the poor little cedar wax waxwings come through here uh, in the late winter and they're super excited to see those red berries because they look like holly berries, which they are evolved to eat. Uh, they are not holly berries and they contain cyanic compounds which means they have cyanide in them and when our little friends the cedar waxwing eat those nandina berries instead of these little holly berries down here or these beauty berries right here they uh, get cyanide poisoning and often die there are lots of evidence in uh, peer-reviewed academic studies of mass die-offs of migratory birds due to that one particular plant right there so do little cedar waxwing friends a favor and murder your Nandina. And if you love that winter berry, uh, replace it with a winter berry or an American holly or a, actually two because they're dioecious, right? You need a male and a female uh, or a beauty berry. And that's a native food source that the cedar waxwing can use. That guy right there again. Isn't he pretty? Thumbs up. Thumbs down to the Nandina. No Nandina. Get rid of them. Who's been to Cooper Young lately? Lindley, I know you have. You live right down the street. <laughs> uh, which one's the uh, which one's the ginkgo? The one on the the one on the right, huh? Kind of hard to tell. They're both kind of pretty. Actually, I would I would wager that the one on the left is a little bit prettier. Um, that's a river birch, Betula nigra. That is native to West Tennessee. And it's lovely in the uh, the fall. If you want to see one in fall color, you can swing by uh, Evelyn next to Cox and look at my girlfriend's house because I planted one there. Uh, pinkos are pretty too. They're not from here. They're not helpful to any of the other earthlings that live in Memphis besides us. And if all we're looking at are aesthetics, I'd say you have a reasonable alternative. So I'm up to the river birch. Uh, there's been some interesting cultivars hitting the commercial market uh, in the eastern red cedar here lately. And like I said, one of my one of my most persistent questions is what's a what's an evergreen that I can replace my my uh, Leland cypress or whatever uh, with. And they are making some really interesting uh, shrub form cedars now that take pruning super well. Uh, and shaping and can be maintained uh, at a very low height, much lower than traditionally, like this big handsome fella here in the middle picture. Also column narf uh, uh, varieties and cultivars as well. Um, but great local resources for native plants. Been working extensively with Brett at Urban Earth. Uh, Dabney out east for you guys that live out east is also a great resource. Ask for Linda, my friend out there, she's an advocate of native plants as well. Um, Strawberry Plains has always got great native plants uh, and Lichterman has a sale in the spring that COVID destroyed this year, sadly, but, but uh, Ann over there does a great job uh, propagating the native species. Um, I think we're probably gonna have to wrap up. It's, we're running out of time because of technical issues. I apologize again. Uh, here's some references for you, a little bit of a reading list. Um, that one on the top, Bringing Nature Home. If you're going to read one book and, and inform yourself about the importance of native species, that's the one to read. Uh, and if you have more questions that we can get to uh, right now, you're more than welcome to reach out to me via email. Uh, that's a painting of my hound dog, Daisy, right there just for everybody to look at and distract you from my email. Um, but I well, think I uh, will, yeah, go ahead, Lindy. I was going to ask if uh, some people had asked a few questions. I was wondering if you might be willing to answer a few of them. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Let me, uh, let me, let me jump out of this 
and get the chat box open. One okay, well, I'll read them to you, so don't worry about that. Ah, um, cool. Yep, go ahead. Let's see. Okay, Juliet Jones, um, I think she had to leave, but we'll answer her question anyway. Um, she would like to know if you do the compost ferry all over Memphis or just in Midtown? No, we are all over uh, Shelby County. We're, we're sneaking out into the, the nether world of Arlington and Millington and all that stuff now. We've got a plan to roll out there soon. Uh, right now, compost ferry curbside service is available in all of the Memphis zip codes, uh, Raleigh, Bartlett, Cordova, Collierville, Germantown, uh, and without restriction. We have thousands of folks uh, in the resident. Uh, we also work with restaurants and office parks and industrial contracts, agricultural contracts. We are, uh, we moved from our little bitty acre and a half facility here in Midtown to a 30 acre facility downtown and have increased our uh, throughput by uh, an order of magnitude since the springtime. We're now working with the city of Memphis and will soon be receiving wood waste and leaves from their curbside collection to process as compost instead of sending that to the landfill as well. Wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Um, well, thanks. And um, also, um, Dale wondered, um, you mentioned the cherry laurel, um, and he wondered, is that, isn't that a thug plant? Because a lot of people think of that as, as sort of a, a thug plant. They, well, they do sucker. That's the thing. And they make lots of babies. So it is, uh, it is a bit more maintenance in, in that way. But I, I find the same to be true from a lot of the, the more traditional um, uh, evergreen screens. Anyhow, I think if you're using, if that's the function in the landscape, uh, then suckering is not so terrible when you're looking for a screen anyway. Uh, but they, in my experience, they're not hard to control, even with all the little babies and such, especially if you're, you know, providing uh, a persistent mulch layer uh, and keeping that uh, added and topped up regularly. But yes, it can be. It's kind of uh, sassafras is another sort of native uh, that tends to sucker and make colonies uh, as well, but also makes a great screen uh, and uh, is super useful in the native ecosystem. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, Liz uh, Palomo uh, says, when looking for native plants, is it enough for it to be native to the U.S.? Or should it be? Should we be thinking about uh, it being native to Tennessee or even Shelby County? Yes. Well, so there's the the more specific you can get, the better. Like this heat zone tends to support uh, the same native plant regardless of the location um, in the eastern biome. Uh, that being said. You don't want to be looking at uh, mountain laurels and rhododendrons from East Tennessee in your landscape here in Memphis. Uh, and that's mostly, I would say, from a maintenance perspective. They, they're used to those cool nights and air drainage. Uh, you're going you're gonna to run into lots of problems trying to keep them healthy here because this isn't what they're adapted to. We're, at the, we're in the River Delta. Uh, this is, was, before we tore it up, a beautiful pristine bottomland forest. Uh, it's hot and humid here. So the plants that that are adapted to this environment are the ones that are going to do the best for you. Uh, the Xerxes Society, uh, which the Blue Xerxes was the first uh, recorded species of butterfly to go extinct through anthropomorphic change. Um, that means it was people's fault. Um, uh, the Xerxes Society is uh, very active and committed to preserving invertebrate species, uh, but especially butterflies and, and native insects. Uh, they have great lists by region uh, for uh, native plants. Uh, that's a great resource. Uh, you can ask me if you have specific uh, plants that you're interested in using in your landscape, uh, or you can reach out to Brett uh, or Linda or Anne, and they will absolutely point you in the right direction as well. 
but we are this is what we would refer to as an ecotone uh and if you move east through tennessee you'll see the plant community change from a, a bottomland dominated forest to an upland dominated forest uh, and the heat zone actually will change as well another thing to keep in mind is that some marginal plants will work inside 240 uh, that won't work outside of 240 we're actually zone 7b inside 240 in memphis and 7a outside of 240 uh, and that is the direct result of urban heat island effect. All the asphalt in here makes it uh, warmer in the winter. Uh, so we have low, um, fewer, uh, we have great more frost free dates inside the, the highway loop than we do outside, which is kind of still amazing to me that we can change things that much, but we do. I never knew but that. I the loop that's really interesting well we have yeah. one suggestion and one more question i'll say the suggestion first um oh another one just popped up um but um someone suggested maybe you could put the book page up <clears throat> during the q a so they can still see the books that you suggested but um <clears throat> this you can answer really quickly because it's a question from me <clears throat> i need to replace a tree in my front yard I was okay. thinking about putting a sourwood tree there. Do you think that's a good idea? A sourwood? Yes. Yeah, sourwood is a is a rare native in this part of the world. Uh, it, it's a little bit high maintenance for this area, but if you give it a a, a, a good start, uh, it should do pretty well here. Um, sourwood is a bit tricky. That's not a that's not a low maintenance native. Uh, if I would say if you lived in Nashville, I would be more, I would be more inclined to say yes than I would in Memphis. How's that? Okay. Well, then I might email you after this, and we'll talk some yeah, more. You, about it. But yeah, we, you're but, more than well, more than welcome to. Absolutely, uh, I'm happy to help you. With that. Okay. So we've got now one more question. Um, knowing this is from Jim and Ann Eoff, knowing you don't like crepe myrtles what causes the upper branches to curve or circle in and lose leaves at the tops and tips <laughs> these do not have black soot disease that's a question ah uh, okay i got gotcha. you all right so here's a fun thing for you so that black soot mold is growing on honeydew um and by Honeydew is the waste product of grape myrtle bark scale. That's what that, that so it's their waste product that the mold is actually growing on, which is uh, kind of gross, actually. Um, at any rate, that's just a, a, a bit of trivia. Um, it sounds like a blight of some kind, and that is m most typically caused by poor soil conditions. Uh, I would I would guess that it is in some form of stress. Uh, I guess I would have to know a little bit more about the planting location uh, and the maintenance program associated to that particular tree. Uh, but they people tend to grow them in some pretty demanding areas, like in the quote unquote hell strip between the street and the sidewalk and all sorts of other stuff, which uh, urban soils are pretty terrible to begin with um, because the first thing you do when you build a house or a road is strip all the topsoil away. Um, so you're already in a compromised soil by the time you start working on your landscape. Um, but the, the, the morphological indicators that, that you provided are typical of stress. So I'm going to say it's either a pathogen caused by imbalances in the soil or it could be drought also, um, depending on the location of the tree. Also, just kill the crepe myrtles and put something else there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are some beautiful crepe myrtles in Cooper Young, though. I will, I will take up for those. But, uh -huh, for sure. um, <laughs> but thank you so much. Mike, I appreciate it. I appreciate you figuring out a way to uh, to get around our technical difficulties. 
And um, so if anybody has any more questions, um, can they get um, in touch with you through your um, website? Yeah, Compost Ferry website uh, directs, actually directs to my office manager, but those questions will come to me. But you can email me at mike at compostferry.com and that comes to me directly. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you so much. And if anybody well, wants to, uh, to unmute and say thanks as you go away, we'd love to hear your voices. Thank you very much. Very informative. Thanks yes, so ma'am. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'm going to close things out. Thanks again. See you soon. Take care. Good talk to you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.